It's finally here. It's Brawl Day. You've been waiting eight months for Pitt football to return. You've been waiting 11 years for this game to return. And you've been waiting 14 years for a win over West Virginia. It's finally here. Well, those first two parts are definitely here. The last part, I'll tell you in about 15 hours, depending on when you watch this video. Welcome to the Morning Pit. September 1st, 2022, Thursday, the start of the 2022 football season, the renewal of the Backyard Brawl, Pitt and West Virginia, lining it up tonight at Acro Shore Stadium to kick off the season. I don't care about those games that happened last weekend. Don't talk to me about the games that happened last weekend. This is Pitt and West Virginia. This is the start of the season, and I don't care about any other games tonight. This is Pitt and West Virginia. This is the start of the 2022 season, and this is the return of the Backyard Brawl. I feel like I should have some entrance music there after I say that. The return of the backyard brawl. Bum, 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 bum. I mean, it's not Monday Night Football, but you follow my point. It's here. I mean, everything we've talked about all off season, everything has led up to this point. And we have talked a lot. We do the Panther Lawyer Show every Wednesday night, right here on youtube.com slash pantherlawyer.com. Hit the subscribe button right there so you can always uh, make sure you know when we go live. And then over the summer, we started doing the weekend recap every Monday all through the summer. And then last week, we started doing this show, The Morning Pit, every day, Monday through Friday, a morning update for you to catch up on everything you need to know about pit sports. And we have been talking through all of those situations, all of those settings. We've been talking about what's finally going to happen tonight. And we'll finally find out. And you know all the storylines, you know all the details, you know all the matchups, you know what's important in this game, you know what's important for this team, and you know what's important for this season. If they want to have a chance to repeat as ACC champions, if they want to push further than they did last year, if they want to achieve at a level unseen with this program in the last 40 years, if they want to top what they did in 2021, we know what they need to do. We know where they need to be good. We know where they need to improve. We know which players need to show themselves, prove themselves. And we know which players need to carry over what they did last season and improve and take another step forward. We know that they have an offensive line full of returning starters and 60-year seniors and 120-some combined career starts. We know that they lost the Heisman Trophy finalists, but they're bringing in the most accurate passer in Pac-12 history and the 13th most accurate passer in NCAA history. We know that they lost the Bletnikoff Award winner, but they're bringing in a freshman All-American wide receiver. We know the other receivers they have back. We know the running backs they have returning. We know the freshman All-American tight end that they have coming back. We know on defense that they brought back virtually the entire defensive line. They brought back all of the safeties. They brought back one of their starting corners and two other guys who, start, who played 400-plus snaps last year. They brought back their do-everything middle linebacker, and while they lost two outside linebackers, They've got some really good players ready to step in there. We know all of this. We know what the schedule looks like. We know the opportunity that these first two games present for a team that enters the season ranked number 17 by the Associated Press in the preseason poll. We know the opportunity that you have when you have two back-to-back -back Power 5 non-conference opponents to open the season. And the reality that by the end of September, you could be a top 12 team if you don't screw it up. We know the opportunity that the rest of this schedule provides. The opportunity probably to be top 10, top 8 by mid-October. And potentially be looking at having your name mentioned in the college football playoff conversation once that happens around mid-October and heading into the end of that month. We know the opportunities that are out there for this team. We know the opportunities that the schedule presents. And we know the opportunities that this team should have due to its talent and due to its depth. This is a season of opportunity for Pitt, an opportunity to take a big step forward. After they already took a giant step forward last year, the opportunity has presented itself to take yet another step forward in 2022. And we'll find out right off the bat how much of a step forward they're able to take. And they're going to do it against one of their most hated rivals. In some ways, maybe their most hated rival. Because there's, there's genuine hatred for Penn State. Genuine hatred for Penn State, and that goes both ways. But there's something different about West Virginia. There's something dirtier about West Virginia. There's something, you know, Penn State's an argument, West Virginia's a fight. 
It's, there's dislike and hatred all over the place. But this is a fight. This is a brawl. You're 70 miles apart. You're separated by, you know, one or two counties between Pittsburgh and Morgantown. And that hatred and that dislike has always been there. We talked to Dave Wanstead going back to the 1970s. He was recruited to West Virginia. He was considering him because it's so close. The proximity breeds the dislike and the hatred. And that's what makes the Backyard Brawl, the appropriately named Backyard Brawl, such a great rivalry. And one of the best rivalries in, in college football. And I genuinely believe that. And I think anyone who doesn't believe it, maybe either didn't experience it or has forgotten just what goes into this game and what comes with this game. And we're going to see it on the field tonight. We're going to see the crowd go crazy. And we're going to see the if the players, and I said this, I said, I've said this all week, actually. If the players don't get it yet, and I think what we saw out of that bonfire on Tuesday night indicates that just maybe the players do get it. But if the players don't get it yet, when they run onto the field and that crowd goes wild, when the first big play happens for one side or the other and the crowd goes crazy, they're going to get it. They're going to get it real quick. And I think they're going to find out, kind of like Travassi Dennis said it on media day, when they put on that jersey with that Panther head on it and somebody tells them, you hate that guy, they're going to find out that it was already in them. That dislike was already there. And the West Virginia fans, or the West Virginia players are going to figure it out too. And it's not going to take them long to hate Pitt as well. No, I can't wait. I, I, I'm looking for. I mean, I'm excited for this season to start. I'm excited for college football to start. You know, this, this whole time of year brings a lot of excitement. You're doing your fantasy football drafts. Your favorite NFL teams are getting ready to go. And your favorite college teams are about to play. And it starts tonight. And that's awesome. I'm 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 pumped up for this. I'm excited to get back to Acroshore Stadium. I'm excited to keep calling it Acroshore Stadium. I'm excited to sit in Acroshore Stadium. I'm excited to have dinner at Acroshore Stadium. I'm excited to watch this game under the lights in prime time. It's going to be a late night. It's what they make coffee for, right? That's why we take afternoon naps. And don't forget, after this game, not immediately after, but a little while after, we're going to be live right here on YouTube.com slash PantherLairCom to talk about what happened in the return of the Backyard Brawl. I keep estimating maybe around 1.30 or so. It's going to be somewhere around there. I don't know. I'll try and tweet out a, a designated time when I think I know one, but it'll depend on when the game ends, when the post-game press conference is in, and when I get enough work done that I can leave the stadium and you know come back to the PantherLair offices and fire up the live stream machine and start talking. We're going to drink. <laughs> We're going to have a cold one uh, during that one for sure. But if you want to make sure you know when we go live, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click that subscribe button. You'll uh, get a notification to let you know that we just went live. And it's time to tune in for a little talk about the Backyard Brawl. And, and I, I'm kind of looking at it as that's going to be tomorrow's morning pit um, just because I don't think I'm going to get home from the game and record an episode of the Morning Pit. We might as well just go live. And we'll release that, and that'll be your uh, Pit Sports Talk. And maybe we'll do something else, you know, later in the day or over the weekend or something. We'll, we'll see. Depends on what the situation calls for as far as the game and uh, the outcome and all of that. So keep an eye out for that. We'll be live tonight for a conversation after the game, a post-game show, right here on YouTube.com/slash PantherLairCom, and of course. Panther-Lair.com, Pittsburgh.Rivals.com. It's the most comprehensive source of Pitt sports news on the internet. Football, basketball, recruiting, you find it all at PantherLair.com. And message boards where you can hang out with hundreds and thousands of your closest Pitt fan friends. Panther-Lair.com, Pittsburgh.Rivals.com. It's where you want to be throughout the game. If you're not going to the game, you're watching it on TV, stay tuned to the message boards where you can get in the game thread and talk about the game as it happens. And certainly there'll be a lot to talk about after the game as well so the message boards are going to be bumping well into the night so you want to make sure you tune in to that you know we talked to Dave Wanstead yesterday for the morning pit that was a lot of fun hopefully you got a chance to see that um that was a great conversation you should go watch that now if you haven't seen it yet pause this and go watch that video it's on our YouTube channel youtube.com slash pantholericom and then come back and watch the rest of this because we have another guest today our special guest is the quarterback who won the 13-9 game. You've seen him around a lot. He's a color commentator on the Pitt Football Radio broadcasts. He's uh, an assistant or 
he's in the athletic department for major gifts. I don't want to call him an assistant athletic director if he's actually an associate athletic director. I don't want to call him an associate athletic director if he's actually an executive assistant or executive associate athletic director. They have a lot of titles up in that building, and you don't want to get it wrong. So we'll just say he's Pat Bostic. And I think all Pitt fans know him. They all remember him from that game. And in addition to remembering from remembering him from a football game 15 years ago, I think a lot of Pitt fans have gotten to know Pat because he does a lot with fan outreach and he does a lot with connecting with the fan base. And so he's well known among the fans, but he's also got some history with West Virginia. And he's one of the smartest football guys I know. So I said, Pat, we got to talk to you on the morning pit. So I'm beyond delighted to welcome number 19, former pit quarterback, current pit commentator, Pitt Administrator, Pat Bostic. And we're honored to have number 19 himself, Pat Bostic, joining us today. Pat, I really appreciate you uh, coming on the morning pit here. And I, I know this week is probably crazy for you, so I want to jump right into it. We're, we're recording this on Wednesday. We're going to release it on Thursday morning, day of the game. But we're recording it on Wednesday. What's your uh, excitement level like right now? When I talked to Dave Wanstead, he was saying like on Monday, he woke up early in the morning and couldn't go back to sleep because he was thinking about this game. I mean, what's your anticipation level for uh, what's going to happen Thursday night? Yeah, it's um, starting to get up there. I mean, it's starting to feel uh, pretty imminent here. And, you know, just the the, the day before game type stuff, um, you're not used to it necessarily on a Wednesday, but for a game like this, you have people coming into town, you got, you know, various you know shows and um, you know, all, all the Twitter activity, obviously the bonfire last night. Um, and there was some, there's some news that came out of that. So, um, <laughs> it's been, it's been what you thought it would be. And, uh, my excitement level is, uh, right around where it should be. And, and tomorrow I'm sure it'll just kind of crescendo throughout the day. When, when did you start doing the color commentary on the broadcast, Pat? I was trying to remember this When Do you remember when you started? 2011. So my okay. first year out of school. Okay. So you, you got a, a lot of years here. Over over those years, I mean, what were some of the games you were you remember being the most excited for or looking forward to the most going into it? I'm sure the ACC championship last year, uh, maybe some of the Penn State games. I mean, what what games stand out to you as being ones that you were really like, man, I can't wait for this. And where does, you know, this game, this backyard brawl kind of rank among that group? Yeah, my first year, 11, we went down to West Virginia and Morgantown, and I had never been there as a non-player, so I was excited about that. Um, that didn't end very well that game. And I remember my, uh, uh, circuitous route down to the locker room from the press box and there being some bumps and shoves in the process. So, um, that one, you know, Notre Dame in 2012, again, first time back as a non, uh, player, um, just being able to go to campus. And that game obviously was, was a very highly contested game, although it wasn't, you know, anticipated to be that, right. um, I would say, you know, all the all the ND and, and Penn State home games. I didn't call games in 16, so I didn't get a chance to call the the first Penn State game, which um, you know, would have been fun. Um, last year, the ACC championship game was certainly up there, um, and I would say that calling a game at Penn State in 17 and uh, and also not in 17 actually, but in um, I guess it was 19. Yeah. Um, I called a game. I got a chance to call a game at Beaver Stadium, which, you know, growing up where I grew up, you know, I, I went to a couple games there as a kid, and it was cool to be uh, in that environment. And again, that was another game that uh, didn't, didn't end well, but the ACC championship did last year, and that by far takes the cake. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, you know, as Pitt looks to build on that championship, obviously so much of this game on Thursday night and, and this season is going to come down to Keaton Slovis and what he can do. So, I mean, you've watched him throughout spring camp, training camp, I'm sure it's the question you get asked the most. I mean, what, what have you seen? What stands out to you about Keaton Slovis? Um, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the things you can see when you just watch him throw the ball. The mechanics are really good. You know, his feet are really good. I think he climbs the pocket. His pocket presence is, is something that's hard to quantify and really identify unless you really study him. Um, his accuracy has been noted. Um, you know, there's been a couple throws in camp that, you know, are just like wow throws. And they're not, you know, 60-yard bombs. They're you know, a crossing around on the move, you know, a foot in front of a, a defender's helmet to Carter Johnson. I remember that from a scrimmage. Um, I remember, you know, some back shoulder type throws to, to guys like Bub Means. I mean, he just has, he has all the throws. And um, I think this offense, I've said this before, I think this offense suits him more than, than kind of that, that Graham Harrell, Texas Tech, Mike Leach stuff. I think it showcases his ability 
um, to come off play action and see the whole field. I think it showcases his ability to, to get through his progressions um, in, in a, you know, efficient manner and, and, and showcases his ability to make every type of throw, both from under center and the shotgun. I, I said this week that I felt like Frank Signetti's offense tends to, um, I don't want to say like amplify a quarterback's efficiency, but it's, it's a good quarterback. It's a good system for a quarterback to kind of be efficient in. I mean, I think back to 2009 and obviously Bill Stull was a year older than he had been in 20, you know, 2008. But it, it just he was so much more efficient. I felt a lot of that came down to Frank Signetti and, and how he designs the offense, how he calls plays, and, and how he teaches him. I mean, would you agree with that? Do you think this is sort of an efficient quarter, not necessarily a safe quarterback's offense, but a, an efficient quarterback's offense in the way that Frank works it? Yeah, I mean, Frank's Frank's philosophy, and and you know, not to to quote him, but it's it's you know, put as much in as possible in spring and fall camp. You know, throw the kitchen sink at everybody and find out what you're good at. And then pair it down as you get into game plan mode and really identify what the quarterback likes, what they're comfortable with, match it up with what they do well, um, and then call the game according to that, you know, situationally. So, I mean, Keaton's going to have a lot of input into what's on that, on that call sheet on, on tomorrow night. I mean, I'm sure it's already printed and laminated, but um, he's going to have a lot of input into that. And um, that's what you love as a quarterback is you know not only what the coordinator is going to call, but what they're expecting from you on that play. And I felt like with Billy in 09, um, Frank just did an uncanny job of identifying, you know, his kind of wheelhouse and then building a multitude of different ways to run those same concepts so that, you know, it would, Billy could go back there blindfolded and he knew where, you know, where his starting point was, what was going to move him off that and uh, where he had an out. And um, I think Keaton's going to be the same way. I, I think just Keaton has a, you know, 7,500 yards of tape to go off of too, which makes it, you know, easier to identify, you know, what he does well and what he maybe doesn't do as well. So much talk this, this off season about losing Jordan Addison and what it means to the playmakers or, or you know, the skill position players. But I, I don't know. I feel like everything I've seen and everything I've heard is it's all been pretty positive. I mean, I know Pat Narduzzi said on Monday that the receivers give him chest pains, but it seems pretty positive. Kanate Mumfield and Bob means you mentioned Carter Johnson. We know Gavin Bartholomew. I, what have been your impressions of, of the skill group for this offense uh, for what you've seen in, in camp? Yeah, it's probably not, you know, the, the deepest group, but, you know, I think they like to have one or two more probably, but um, you know, there's guys that have made a lot of plays in a pit uniform that are, that probably have gone a little bit under, under reported on because of their consistency. I sp specifically Jared Wayne. I mean, Jared's a guy that like, you know, I said it the other day, I, I feel like you put Mike Shanahan and Devin street together. You'd have Jared Wayne. Um, that's kind of what it reminds me of. He, he's just, he's a great possession receiver. He's consistent across the middle. He can take a hit. He's dependable, but he's also made a lot of big plays in his career down the field. Think about the catch against Miami and some of the plays he's made in the ACC championship game. Um, and then guys, you know, Jalen Barden, Jalen Barden's made a lot of plays. And then you mix in Kanate Mumfield, Bub Means, you, you mix in obviously Gavin, a freshman All-American and Carter Johnson. There's there's a full complement of guys that join those four tailbacks that are back there that I think Frank can deploy this offense in a number of different ways. And I, I think when you, you know, when we get a couple of games into this year, the, the formational and, and uh, personnel group breakdown will be a much more variable than it was a year ago. Right. You know, looking at the West Virginia side, I mean, what, what do you make of JT Daniels? I'm sure you've been trying to watch tape and trying to catch up to have some you know, sort of foundation of information on him. I mean, what, what have you learned about, about him? What do you expect to see out of him uh, on Thursday night? Yeah, I expect them to throw it a lot. Obviously, I think schematically you would, you would expect that from a Graham Harrell offense. Uh, you, know, you know, he can really – Daniels can really throw it. I mean, he's, he's a pure passer. He's a pocket guy. He's not going to move outside of it. I'd imagine the RPO is, is uh, running back run and, and quarterback pass. It's not going to be a, a whole heck of a lot of quarterback run. I, I, I don't foresee – um, and they've got some big perimeter players. So, you know, it wouldn't shock me to see, you know, some of the game plans you've seen in the past, you know, getting the perimeter, getting the flat early, you know, try to try to slow that defensive line down with some screens and and uh, and draw type runs and and then take your shots with, you know, with kind of intermediate fades. You know, they've got some guys that are six, three, six, four. And, you know, that's that's a throw that's given to you in this defense. Um, it'll be interesting to see. You know how Marquez Williams and, and AJ Woods and Devonshire and Battle and all those guys match up out there. And you know, if West Virginia is used to seeing the press that 
Pitt has and how, uh, if at all, that that disrupts their timing and rhythm. And because again, I mean, it, it's a, a fades a it's it's a throw that's given to you, but it's also a low percentage throw. Um, and one of the reasons that Pat Narduzzi, you know, always says we'll, we'll give them that, but if they hit it, it becomes problematic. Right. Right. I, you know, I think Pitt's offensive line, we've talked about it as a strength so much, but West Virginia has got some players on the D line. I mean, do you, you know, is this going to be a situation where maybe on both sides for both teams, the defense starts a little faster just because, you know, even if the O lines both have a lot of returning players, you know, it's first game, just kind of getting used to everything. You know, could you see the, you know, both sides defenses, maybe controlling the line of scrimmage at least early in the game? Yeah, I, I think, you know, there would be a feeling out process as, all, as there always is at an opener. Um, you know, the thing that you, you look at with, you know, with Pitt's defensive line and what Pitt's offensive line is used to in camp, for the most part, you know how they're going to line up. They're a four-down team on base downs, and they'll get into their delta and on, on third down. But when you're running the ball and you're in your typical, you know, typical play calling mode, they're in a four-down set with a, with a, a nose tackle and a three technique. You know, West Virginia is in and out of the three, four, four, three that kind of shift around. And I can see them because in Stills kid, the nose tackle is a really good player. Um, that's obviously, a, you know, he's a lineage guy there. He's a legacy kid. He's a really, really good football player. That's I know Dave Warwell is focused on, um, but they can do some things with, with shifting around at, at, at or before the snap, um, obviously with some some slants and stunts that, you know, slow a, a pit offensive line that wants to establish the line of scrimmage down it kind of muddies things up and it may take a series or two to figure that out and see how they're going to line up. Because, you know, a year ago with big 12 tape, you're seeing a lot of flex tight end and three wide receiver stuff. Um, you know, and if Pitt does what Frank said he's done in the past, line up to come out there with some two back and two tight end, it'll be curious to see if the hit sheet from a year ago holds true um, in 2022. Right. Uh, you know, Pat, your other, you know, obviously do the radio broadcast, but you're also, um, you know, involved with major gifts and development and, and kind of, I feel like you're a, a fan outreach guy. I feel like you're maybe as much as anybody in your building tied into the, the pit fan base. What have you seen just in the last eight months? You know, I, you know, wh- how has the fan support just turned up from the success that they had last season? Yeah, it's, it's been in a number of ways, Chris. I mean, you know, obviously you see it a lot on your platform. I mean, obviously the, the traffic subscriptions, I'm sure they're up. I mean, it's people following recruiting people following, things obviously season ticket sales I mean we're going to set a record um tonight tomorrow night rather for the for this game at at Acrisure Stadium um a stadium record a Pittsburgh record for a sporting event Pitt fans have a lot to do with that you know we had you know our largest fundraising year uh in history uh at Pitt you know we raised over 40 million dollars last year which is you know almost double our yearly average so that's not just you know Chris Bickle given you know an unprecedented gift that's obviously a big part of 40 if you do the math um, but it's, it's also an additional 20 from a, a, a whole host of people and over 10,500 donors. Um, so it's just, you know, you're, you try to build it all at the same time, right? The, the top of the food chain, the big hitters that are going to be able to help you truly move the needle immediately, but then the kind of the grassroots stuff, that's going to be the most sustainable form of support moving forward. And, um, I think pit fans know, all, obviously that they love winning. You, you love what happened last year, but. It's also everyone's going to play a role in where this program's position moving forward, um, because and not just football, but that's what we're talking about. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of movement and um, fan support, alumni engagement. You know, the, what you're able to do financially for your program is critical if you want to be in that whatever 40 or 50 or 60 teams that have a chance to win a title. All right, Pat, we're going to let you get back to your uh, busy week. I know it has been, uh, and we will uh, see you at Ackershore Stadium on Thursday night. I think it's going to be a fun one for uh, all, all parties involved. But thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see, you, uh, we'll see you at the stadium. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Pat Bostic, for joining us. That was a lot of fun uh, chatting with him. He's got great memories, and even more than the memories, I mean, he is – He's a really smart football guy, and I thought the stuff he said about Keaton Slovis was really encouraging. Um, I think he's impressed with these playmakers. I, I think he likes a lot of what he sees out of this offense, and he really likes Frank Signetti. And that's probably something we haven't talked about, and I mean, we talked about so many things over the summer and certainly through training camp. We probably haven't talked about the Signetti impact enough, and maybe we'll get a better sense of it as time goes on. But I think Signetti, Signetti is going to be a significant positive influence on this offense and he's going to help Keaton Slovis 
and he's going to make sure he's going to get the ball to the playmakers. I think he's going to design this offense well for Slovis and well for the playmakers. And I think the end result should be an efficient, productive offense. And we'll see what it looks like tonight. I've told you all summer that I think this might be a sloppy game. Might take a little while for them to get comfortable. Might take a little while for both teams to sort of figure out what they're doing. And so you might not see the best version of Pitt's offense. But unlike previous years in the season opener, I think you're going to see something close to the full version of Pitt's offense. We know in the past they've held things back. I don't think that's going to happen this year. It's all guns blazing to take down the Mountaineers. I can't wait. You know, I don't know what time you're watching this uh, this this morning pit show we tried to release it around seven so let's say about 12 hours until kickoff 12 hours till kickoff means you should leave about three hours from now uh just to get there in time because traffic is going to be a disaster but uh, i can't wait i'm excited i think you are too really looking forward to it make sure you stay tuned to pantherlayer.com panther-layer.com it's the most comprehensive source pit sports news on the internet and of course subscribe to the youtube channel youtube.com slash pantherlayer.com like this video we always ask you to do that like this video leave a comment if you got something you want to say about anything you heard from pat or anything i said uh subscribe to our youtube channel like this video leave a comment do all those things to engage with us because we're having a lot of fun doing this i'm having a lot of fun doing this and i hope you appreciate or i hope you enjoy these uh videos as well so have a great rest of the day you'll be counting down the minutes until seven o'clock i know i will be too can't wait looking forward to it we'll see you at Acker Shore stadium and then we'll talk to you don't forget we're going to talk to you after the game tonight right here at youtube.com slash